Thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, I thought I would just uh, give a brief overview of what happened and what continues to happen in Bhopal and why we are here uh, 40 years later. Um, so as, as most of you know, this is not only the world's worst industrial disaster, but also the world's worst and deadliest corporate massacre. And, uh, and it has not been seen through that lens, or maybe because it is what it is that people in Bhopal have not gotten justice. I mean, we have uh, uh, the perpetrators are two chemical corporations, Union Carbide and Dow Chemical, that are part of the U.S. industrial military complex. And uh, the affected people are the most vulnerable and most poor people where the gas leaked. Uh, this was, again, about 50 percent Muslims who were affected and 50 percent Hindus that were affected. Out of that, 70 percent come from, uh, from the Dalit uh, caste. So, so on that one single exposure on the night of 2nd and 3rd December in 1984 killed about eight to 10,000 people in the immediate aftermath. This is after talking to the truck drivers who carried the dead bodies from the streets and from people's homes and threw them into the uh, Narmada River because there were just too many people to be burned and buried. And over the years, more than 25,000 people have died due to exposure-related illnesses. This was, again, not a disaster. This was a disaster in making. And we call it a genocide, as more than half a million people were maimed for the rest of their lives. Um, again, Union Carbide, uh, the, uh, the company that ran a pesticide plant, this was the time of Green Revolution, where apparently it was thought our farmers were not producing enough food, so we needed pesticides to be pumped into our fields so that more food could be produced. Uh, it was a majority owned by Union Carbide Corporation, where the design and the technology uh, was supplied by them. And again, this was uh, very similar to what was happening in Institute, but this was unproven and untested technology. Uh, there was massive, there was deliberate cost cutting, deliberate uh, design of the hazardous waste management system was badly designed. And all of these were decisions taken in the boardroom where business was considered as usual and to today is also considered as usual, right? Uh, it, the, when people, things were so bad that the PA system on that night of carbide factory was not working, so people could be told not to run, not, not to run towards the hospital. The faster they ran, the faster they died as MIC entered into their bloodstream, uh, women aborting on streets and damaging their immune systems and their lungs and their eyes and crossing the pulmonary as well as the placental ba barrier. And at the end of the day, most people got $500 in compensation. That's 93% of them. It took anywhere from 8 to 18 years where, where all victims were robbed of their dignity, uh, you know, and it was called the humanitarian settlement that Union of India negotiated with Union Carbide without consulting a single survivor, without having any medical records on on board. Uh, totally unconnected to the Bhopal disaster is the ongoing environmental disaster that Bhatti will speak about, which affects about 200,000 people today where the groundwater is contaminated. And in all of, all of this, uh, not a single company or a corporation has gone to jail even for a day for, for, for disabling a new generation, for killing and maiming half a million people, for make it, the toxic waste still being there. No, 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 no one has been held accountable uh, for that. And the corporations have learned a great deal. I mean, Bhopal is not isolated by geography of, or location by any means. The uh, act of deflecting responsibility is not new to Union Carbide and Dow. The corporate whaling is not new to uh, uh, Union Carbide and Dow. But apparently, Dow refuses to take any of the responsibility of Union Carbide, calling it, well, we just took the assets and we will leave the liabilities and something called the reverse triangular merger, you know, that, that exists. But at this 40th year, we, we, you know, the only thing that it has stayed the same in Bhopal is people fighting. 
people fighting for justice and people fighting for a life of dignity and to ensure that there, no, there are no more Bhopals. And that in a way, we all live in Bhopal if the current precedent is not changed, where corporations can come, kill, pollute, change their names, pay $500, come back, do business, and get away with murder. Yeah. And that is when, as invincible corporations may seem, it is only the collective power of ordinary people like us, like you, who have brought them to their knees. And we hope that this 40th anniversary will give that push that is needed within US, maybe within the US Congress and Senate. Um, and also, we're doing similar stuff in, the, um, in, the, uh, in India as well. So I will leave it at that, and I'll have the so if I ever speak, I will translate, and yeah, okay. मैं फरहत जहां भोपाल शहर से हूं, वो भोपाल जहां पे यूनियन कार्बाइड फैक्ट्री ने एक ही रात में हजारों लोगों की जान ली नरसंघार मचाया उस रात हजारों लोग तो मारे गए बहुत सी लेडी से महिलाओं के अधूरे बच्चे गिरे और पांच लाख से ज्यादा लोगों को उसने स्थायी रूप से विकलांग कर दिया उस हादसे के टाइम पे मैं पांच महीने की थी हमारे फैमिली यूनियन कार्बाइड से डेढ़ किलोमीटर दूरी पे रहते थे हम लोग मैं तो बहुत छोटी थी लेकिन अम्मी पापा बताते हैं कि वो रात हम लोग के लिए बहुत काली रात थी हम लोग सभी सो रहे थे ठंडी रात थी लेकिन बाहर से बहुत तेज चीखने चिल्लाने की आवाजें आई तो पापा ने गेट खोल के देखा तो बाहर लोग भाग रहे थे बहुत तेजी से कोई किसी को बता नहीं पा रहा था ठीक से कि क्या हुआ है कुछ समझते इतने में हम गैस हमारे घर में भर गई कमरा था जो उसमें आ गई अम्मी पापा ने मेरे भाई बहनों को और मुझे लेके उन्होंने भी भागना शुरू कर दिया और भागते भागते अम्मी अलग हो गई पापा अलग हो गए मैं अम्मी के साथ थी तो अम्मी बताती हैं उस रात उनकी आंखों में इतनी तकलीफ थी जैसे कि उनकी आंखों में एसिड डाल दिया हो किसी ने वो भागते भागते एक छोटा सा पार्क था वहाँ चली गई वहाँ एक बड़ा सा पत्थर था सारे रात वो मुझे उस पत्थर के सहारे सर झुकाए बैठी रही जिस तरह आंखों से ठंडक मिल जाए उस पत्थर से उनको माय नेम इज फारत जहाँ आई कम फ्रॉम भोपाल Every, all of you know about the Bhopal disaster that one night that killed thousands where women aborted and more than half a million people were maimed and it was a genocide in our city. I was five months old at the time of the disaster. I lived about a kilometer and a half away from the factory with seven people, of seven members in my family. Uh, <clears throat> it was a cold night. My parents heard screaming from outside, run, run, run for your life. They were not able to understand what was happening. My father opened the gate to our house, and by that time, he could understand anything. The gas had already entered in our house. So we couldn't stay back in our house. My family started running. Uh, my father took my other siblings, and my mother had me because I was very little. They both, both got separated. My mother uh, took me and ran with me as much as she could. She, she told me her eyes felt like that someone had put acid in them. And she ran, ran towards the park holding me and all night, she, all she wanted was water, but she found a stone that was cold and rested her eyes on that because her eyes were burning. And that, and that somehow that night passed. <laughs> वो रात तो निकल गई हम लोगों के लिए लेकिन जब अम्मी बताती हैं सुबह की तरफ घर की तरफ आए तो वहाँ का नज़ारा ही कुछ अलग था आज शायद मेरी अम्मी होती तो वो और रो नहीं लगती लेकिन वो बताती हैं कि लोग अपने लोगों को लाशों में ढूंढ रहे थे कि किसी का कोई मरा पड़ा है तो लोग पलट पलट के देख रहे थे कोई बच्चा रो रहा है और मवेशी मरे हुए पड़े थे हमारे घर में उस टाइम पर बहुत पेड़ लगे थे अनार के तो वो जब सुबह देखा तो वो तक जल गए थे उसके असर से वो असर वो हादसा एक दिन का नहीं था एक रात का नहीं बल्कि हमारी ज़िंदगी पे आज तक उसने असर छोड़ा है उस टाइम पे आ, मेरी अम्मी की आज ये कंडीशन है कि जब से वो बीमार रहने लगी हादसे के बाद से थोड़ा लेकिन आज उनकी कंडीशन ये है कि उनको लंग फाइब्रोसिस हो चुका है वो बिना इन्हेलर के बिल्कुल नहीं रह पाती थोड़ा सा काम करना है इन्हेलर ले करना है उनको उसके अलावा कुछ नहीं कर पाती वो मेरी बड़ी बहन जो गैस हादसे के टाइम पर दो साल की थी आज उनकी जिंदगी सिर्फ डायलिसिस पे जिंदा है वो हर दूसरे दिन डायलिसिस के लिए जाना है उनकी किडनियाँ पूरी तरह फेल हो चुकी हैं क्योंकि आज तक हम लोगों का कोई सही इलाज ही नहीं मिला है हमें जब हम दवाई लेने जाते हैं सिर्फ हमें 
लक्षणिक इलाज दिया जाता है दर्द की दवाई दे दी जाती है बहुत सारी एंटीबायोटिक दे दी जाती है क्योंकि यूनियन कार्बाइड ने जो इलाज था वो छुपाया 1970 में ही यूनियन कार्बाइड को पता हो चुका था कि अगर एम गैस लगेगी किसी को तो एक दिन का नहीं बल्कि जिंदगी भर की तकलीफ होगी ये जानते हुए भी उसने जो सोडियम थाई सल्फेट की दवाई थी वो नहीं बताया इलाज अगर या उस रात वो एक अनाउंसमेंट हो जाता कि भागना नहीं है अपने घरों में रहना है कम्बल ओढ़ के ठंडे तो शायद हम लोगों की जो तकलीफें हैं आज थोड़ा कम होती In the morning, when my mother started to walk back, she described, and if she was here, she would probably cry. But she, all she remembers seeing was dead people on the streets and people looking for their dead ones, dead animals, dead people. Our house had pomegranate trees, and all the the leaves on that tree had gone black. This was something that this was a disaster that has co consequences that continue to unfold even today. My mother has pulmonary. Uh, fibrosis and she's not able to do much household work or any work without inhaler my sister who was two years old at the time of the disaster is currently on dialysis and has to uh, get dialysis three times a, a week she suffers from kidney renal failure there are so many people like her uh, who suffer from kidney renal failure because MIC never uh, because union carbide never revealed the toxicology of gases that leaked on that night making treatment almost impossible so currently there are people who get only symptomatic treatment people who have taken antibiotics and painkillers and drugs all their lives in human huge quantities union carbide in 1970 knew we know this now they knew that an ex single exposure to mic will cause lifelong injury yet all of us were categorized as suffering from no minor injury uh, they withheld the information of sodium thiosulfate they made sure that we never got this information the only antidote that could have worked only to save farad did mention this they, the reason sodium thiosulfate was not uh, was banned for some time so there was a german scientist who had come max donder brought about 10000 a ampules of sodium thiosulfate saying if people were given this uh, it would make them feel better as they would secrete thiocyanate through their urine there were many many volunteers who were volunteer doctor volunteers who were volunteering their time in bhopal they were administering government was administering and then union carbide uh, issued an advisory few weeks later saying that they do not believe in the efficacy KC of sodium thiosulfate so government of india banned sodium thiosulfate and jailed every person every non government person who was doing this in their personal capacity and we know this we know this now because you know uh, icmr did study basically what carbide feared because carbide's original defense was that this is like tear gas there will be no internal damage that that, that the gas will not cross your pulmonary or your placental barrier or it would enter your bloodstream but once you say that you are secreting thiocyanate through your urine that means it has entered your bloodstream and the liability of the corporation will go up uh, tremendously and it will no longer be a minor injury where 93% of the people were eventually uh, given compensation for and the last thing farad said was basically that uh, announcement uh, that even even something as simple as uh, as making sure that they would have announced that don't run in the direction of wind don't run in the direction of hospital maybe so many would not would not have suffered so badly ये एम आई सी गैस ने हमारे शरीर में घुस कर हमें तो तकलीफ दी और हमारे सकून में मिल के इसने हमारे जो अंदर का सिस्टम है इतनी खराबियां पैदा कर दी कि हमारी आने वाली जो पीढ़ी है उन तक ये असर पहुंचा मेरी छोटी बहन जो गैस कांड के चार साल बाद हुई थी वो चौबीस साल में ख़त्म हो गई उसका भी किडनियाँ फेल हो चुका था और उसके बाद वो अपने पीछे दो बच्चियों को छोड़ के गई है दो लड़कियाँ एक लड़की बिल्कुल विकलांग है जो चौदह साल की है ना बोल पाती सुन पाती ना खा पाती उसके पापा ने भी उसको रखने से छोड़ दिया क्योंकि वो विकलांग है वो उसको नहीं रखना चाहते आज मेरी अम्मी और मैं उसको रखे हुए हैं और सिर्फ उसको मिक्सी में घोल के हम लोग खाना ऐसा खिलाते ये मेरी नहीं 
हर गैस पीड़ित परिवार की यही कहानी है हर दूसरे तीसरे घर में आपको जन्मजात विकृति वाले बच्चे मिल जाएंगे टीबी की बीमारी हमारे में आम हो चुकी है क्योंकि हमारी रोग प्रतिरोधक क्षमता बिल्कुल कम हो चुकी है टीबी बैक्टीरियल इन्फेक्शन से होती है लेकिन हमारा इतना इम्यूनिटी है ही नहीं कि हम उससे लड़ सकें टीबी की बीमारियों ने घेर रखा है किडनी की बीमारियां आम होती जा रही हैं हमारे जनजात विकृति के साथ बच्चे पैदा हो रहे हैं ऑल्सो देर हैज बिन इम्पैक्ट ऑन द नेक्स्ट जनरेशन माई माई सिस्टर हु वॉज बॉर्न फोर ईयर्स आफ्टर द डिजास्टर डाइड एट एज ट्वेंटी फोर अगेन ड्यू टू किडनी रीनल फेलियर लेफ्ट बिहाइंड टू किड्स बोथ ऑफ दैम डॉटर्स वन ऑफ दैम इज फोर्टीन ईयर्स ओल्ड टूडे एंड शी इज शी वॉज बॉर्न टोली फिजिकली एंड मेंटली disabled the father dis her father decided that he would no longer take care of her so it is me and my mother who take care uh, take take care of her and this is not just about my family it is about so many other families who are going through the same thing tb while it is a bacterial infection but because the exposure to mic has caused uh, damage to the immune system there are many more people many more gas victims are dying through tb kidney failure and 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 cancers and many children being born with birth defects मैं एक जनसेवी संस्था में काम करती हूँ वो संस्था जो गैस पीड़ितों को तो इलाज देती है साथ में जो पानी पीड़ित लोग हैं उनको भी इलाज देती है जो सरकार है सरकार ने आज तक पानी पीड़ितों को कोई इलाज नहीं दिया लेकिन मेरी संस्था में मिलता है यहाँ इलाज और मैं वहाँ पे शोध विभाग ही वहाँ पर काम करती हूँ मैं गैस पीड़ित समुदाय और अपीड़ित समुदाय दोनों समुदाय में जाती हूँ और लोगों से घर घर जा स्वास्थ्य के ऊपर जानकारी लेके डेटा कलेक्ट करती हूँ अभी हमारा एक छोटा सा रिसर्च आया है 2015-17 का हमारा चौरानवे हज़ार का कोहट पॉपुलेशन है जिसमें हम लोग देखते हैं कि गैस पीड़ित लोगों में क्या समस्या है आपीड़ित लोगों में क्या है और कंटेमिनेटेड एरिया में और जो बोथ हैं उनमें लेकिन अभी हमारा एक छोटा सा स्टडी है जो 15-17 में आई है दो से सत्रह के बीच उसमें जो गैस पीड़ित लोग हैं उनका कंपेयर अनएक्सपोज से किया तो उसमें पाया जो गैस पीड़ित लोग हैं उनमें तिरसठ गुना ज़्यादा बीमारियां हैं जिसमें सांस की तकलीफ नींद ना आना घबराहट बेचैनी इसी तरह जो मरने वाला का है दर वो भी गैस पीड़ितों में अट्ठाईस गुना ज़्यादा है जिसमें सबसे ऊपर है टी वी लकवा और कैंसर और गुर्दे की बीमारी से मरने वाले लोग हैं I work in an organization that provides free medical care to those who have been exposed to MIC and also to those who live in area where the groundwater is contaminated. Government does not uh, give free treatment to those who live in con contaminated area because they con they don't consider th them as people affected by union carbides. poisons but where i work they do so i my job is to visit we we have made a cohort of about 94000 people and my job is to visit in both communities communities that have been exposed to groundwater contamination and gas exposed and in control area where there is no 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 such contamination and i collect data going going house to house of of 94000 people with with a team of people and into a 2020 2015 to 17 we did a small study uh, uh, and we found that people exposed to gas face about 63 times uh, more morbidities when compared to uh, so chronic illnesses when compared to those who were unexposed and the death rate among them was 28 times higher and major causes of death was again also paralysis kidney cancers and tb haal hi mein abhi covid hua iske bhi aankde saaf batate hain ki jo us pe bhi study aayi hai ki jo gas pirit log hain unme 3 guna zyada log hain कोविड से मरने वाले क्योंकि उनकी रोग प्रतिरोधक क्षमता तो बिल्कुल ना के बराबर होगी वो लड़ नहीं पाते वो बीमारियों से बड़ी तो इससे पता चलता है कि ज़्यादा तीन गुना ज़्यादा मरे हैं लोग कोविड में ये सब यूनियन कार्बाइड ने हमें ज़िंदगी भर की तकलीफ दी उसके लिए सिर्फ 500 डॉलर का मुआवजा दिया वो मुआवजा भी इस आठ से अट्ठारह साल में हमें मिला और उसके लिए भी हमें वहाँ इतना जलील होना पड़ता है कि हमें साबित करना है वहाँ पर कि हमको गैस लगी है हमें अगर साबित नहीं कर पाते तो हमें डॉक्टर से लिखवा के लेकर जाना है हमें वकील से लिखवा के लेके जाना है हमको ही साबित करना है हम जलील भी हो रहे हैं तकलीफ भी झेल रहे हैं और हमें साबित करना है कभी कंपनी ने नहीं ये कहा कि नहीं हमने तुम्हें ये जहर पिलाया हमने तुम्हें तकलीफ़ दी है हमने तुम्हारी आने वाली पीढ़ियों को ख़राब किया है 
कभी ऐसा कुछ नहीं हुआ सरकारें शोध संस्था प्रदूषण नियंत्रण बोर्ड ये सब कंपनियों के साथ ही होते और कंपनियों का सिर्फ एक ही उद्देश्य होता है सिर्फ मुनाफा कमाना For all of this, we got $500 in compensation that took anywhere from eight to 18 years to get. And that process humiliated us. It, it, we had to prove, we had to get a doctor, we had to get a lawyer, we had to prove that the injuries, that my, the, the injuries in my household of my family members was due to the, uh, the exposure. Union Carbide never had to say that onus was on us. And what we have seen in so many years that uh, our, that we are not only just fighting our own government and our corporation, but also our pollution control boards and research organizations whose job it is to protect our health and environment. But what we see that all of them, all of them together are working for the interest of the corporation and not, uh, and not, not, not for the victims. जब हम लोग यहाँ आए तो मुझे लगा हमारे शायद भोपाल में ये हादसा हुआ है वहीं पे लेकिन जब हम अलग अलग जगहों पे यहाँ पे गए वेस्ट साउथ डिट्रॉइट ईस्ट ह्यूस्टन कैंसर रैली ईस्ट पैलेस्टाइन हमने वहाँ पे देखा कि जैसे हम लोगों के साथ हुआ यहाँ पे भी लोगों के साथ हो रहा है वही कंपनियाँ वही यहाँ के लोगों के भी साथ कर रही हैं लेकिन कंपनियां उन्हीं को अपना शिकार बनाती जो या माइनॉरिटी के होते हैं अलग कलर के होते हैं दलित होते हैं उन्हीं के साथ ये होता है हमेशा ये जो धीमा भोपाल जो वहाँ था वो यहाँ पे भी हो रहा है हमारा भोपाल एक मिसाल बनना चाहिए हमारी लड़ाई बहुत लंबी है संघर्ष की कि कहीं और दूसरा भोपाल ना बन सके हम अपनी आने वाली पीढ़ियों को बचा सके हम एकजुट होकर इन कंपनियों के खिलाफ खड़े हो सके when i first came from bhopal we just uh, to here we never thought that things would be the same things would be same here as well we visited cancer rally east houston southwest destroyed east palestine and so many places and we see similar things happening it is it is people of color it is low income communities that are fa be, uh, be facing the brunt of, of this <coughs> and we see so many slow and silent bhopals happening it, in front of us our, fi our fight is our fight is long and our fight is to save the next generation and our fight is to uh, is for is for justice ye 40vi barsi hai gas plant ki hum log yahan par aaye aapka saath chahte hain ki 3 december ke din aap bhi yahan pe kuch kare dao ke karkhane ke samne banner leke khade hain aur social media pe hamari kahani bhopal ki jo halat hai abhi ki wo bataye यहाँ के सांसदों को बताएं, यहाँ के जो कांग्रेस में ने उनको बताएं आप। This is the 40th anniversary of the disaster and we seek your support um, in talking about how the Bhopal disaster continues to unfold. Um, hold the banner outside the Dow's office if you can on 3rd December. Uh, tell the U.S. Congress people and senators to support uh, a resolution on Bhopal. Uh, मैं बतीवाई रजक भोपाल शहर से जो भोपाल शहर 40 साल पहले गैस का हादसा हुआ था उस वक्त यूनियन कार्बाइड फैक्ट्री से करीब मैं डेढ़ किलोमीटर दूर अपने परिवार के साथ रहती थी और उस रात करीब एक बज रहा था जब गैस हादसा हुआ तो हम सब सो रहे थे रात को एक बजे तो बाहर से चीखने चिल्लाने की आवाज आई बचो भागो ऐसी कौन सी हवा चल रही है कौन सी आंधी चल रही है जो आंखों में जलन और गले में खांसी हो रही है तो पापा मम्मी ने गेट खोल के देखा तो बाहर मतलब इधर से उधर इधर से उधर लोग भाग रहे थे बच्चों को पकड़ पकड़ के और अपने परिवार के साथ में लेकिन हमारे पापा मम्मी ने सोचा भागने से अच्छा अपना घर घर में रहे तो ज्यादा ठीक रहेगा तो गीला कम्बल और रजाई गीली करके हम लोगों को रात भर उसमें छिपाए रखे 
और बिठाए रखे और जब सुबह उठे तो देखा कि मतलब हजारों लाशें रास्ते में पड़ी थी जो हजारों लाशें थी उनमें से कोई बेहोश भी था और कोई माँ खत्म हो गई थी तो छोटा बच्चा रो रहा था ये सब हमारे पापा मम्मी हमको बताते थे कि उस समय ये ऐसा हादसा हुआ था लेकिन वो हादसा ए जो मतलब उस रात मर गए वो बड़े किस्मत वाले थे और हम बदकिस्मत हैं जो आज बच गए हैं तो 40 साल के बाद भी आज वो जहर की वजह से हम पीड़ित हैं और वो गैस इतनी जहरीली थी कि मेरे परिवार में बहुत ज़्यादा मेरे परिवार को गैस लगी आँखों में और सांस लेने में तकलीफ होती थी तो मेरे पापा मम्मी से काम नहीं बनता था उस चक्कर में मैं आठवीं तक पढ़ी हूँ सरकारी स्कूल में उसके बाद मुझे पढ़ाई छोड़ना पड़ी मजदूरी करने जाना पड़ी क्योंकि मेरे पापा मम्मी से मजदूरी नहीं होती थी मेहनत का काम और उसके बाद में मेरे भाई को आंखों से कम दिखता था जो मेरे से बड़ा था तो ऐसे लाइट लगाने गए थे तो वो लाइट दिखी उन्हें कि लग गई लेकिन वो हाथ पे गिर गई तो उसके वजह से खत्म हो गए उनको दिखाई नहीं दिया था माई नेम इज बती बाई रजक Uh, I also lived with my fa uh, family about a kilometer and a half from the factory. There were five of us. I was I was four. Can I tell you something? She was four years old at the time of the di disaster. Uh, we were uh, all we remember is we were sleeping. There was a lot of chaos. People saying run, and there was screaming. No one knew what was going on. Coughing, and everyone's eyes were burning. My father. decided not to run he put three of us there were five of us so three siblings he decided he would just put us under wet blankets in the and in the morning when we woke up when we opened the door of our houses outside and walked outside we saw so many dead people outside mothers who were dead and their children crying people half clothed so that is how they ran what i know is is that lucky ones they were the lucky ones who died on that night because they don't have to suffer the way we do and they are, they don't have to bear the scars like we bear it today my family after that could no longer work i had to i went to school till 8th grade and after that i had to start working because my both of my parents were unable unable to work me and my brother uh, also worked my brother was badly affected his eye in his eyes and he couldn't he didn't see very well after the disaster and one day he was trying to fix in an electricity thing and he got electrocuted and died at kitne saal ka tha 14 saal ka tha 14 to 15 at 14 or 15 years of age ये सब हुआ है यूनियन कार्बाइड फैक्ट्री की वजह से जो कि यूनियन कार्बाइड फैक्ट्री उन्नीस में वहां पर खुली थी और उसने तीन तालाब बनाए थे कचरा निष्पादन के लिए और जो तालाब बनाए थे उसमें पन्नी की तिरपाल बना के बिछाई गई थी और कुछ सालों बाद वो तिरपाल फट गई और फटने के कारण वहाँ की मिट्टी और पानी में जहर घुर गया जो कि फैक्ट्री से करीब एक किलोमीटर दूर दो किलोमीटर दूर कुछ लोग पहले से रहते थे और उसके बाद में कुछ लोग अभी रहने लगे तो वो पानी और मिट्टी पानी मतलब जहरीला हो गया तो वहाँ के लोग पीते थे और वो तालाब में पशु पक्षी जानवर पानी पीने लगते पीने लगे थे जिसके कारण वहाँ पे पशु पक्षी मरने लगे पानी पी के तो फिर हमारे जो गैस पीड़ित संगठन है उसको मालूम चला कि ये ऐसा कैसा हो रहा है कि तालाब के पानी पीने से जानवर मर रहे हैं फिर हमारे संगठन ने वहाँ की जांच करवाई पानी की तो उसमें नो निर्जीविकल केमिकल पाया गया है जिसके कारण वहाँ के बस्ती वाले लोग भी बीमार रहने लगे और फिर उसके बाद में हम लोग वो बीमार रहने लगे अलग अलग तरीके की बीमारी होने लगी तो हम लोग दो बार दिल्ली गए पैदल तो वहाँ पे प्रधानमंत्री के पास धरना रखा भूख हड़ताल करी और मतलब रैली निकाली ये सब करा और पुलिस वालों ने हमको डंडे भी मारे हमें जेल में भी बंद करा लेकिन हम अपनी लड़ाई से पीछे नहीं हटे जो कि उसके बाद में जो लड़ाई हुई फिर हम लोग आ गए वापस तो 2012 में हमें पानी तो स्वच्छ मिला है पाइपलाइन बिछा के लेकिन आज भी ऐसी स्थिति है कि दो दिन तीन दिन नल नहीं आते हैं तो वही जहरीला बोर का पानी हमें पीना पड़ती है जिसके कारण हमारे शरीर में अलग अलग तरीके की बीमारियां हो रही है तो वहाँ की महिलाओं की जो जांच करवाई हम लोगों ने संगठन ने 
दूध की जांच करवाई महिलाओं के दूध की तो उसमें मरकरी पाई गई है जहर पाया गया है जिसके कारण महिलाएं बच्चा विकलांग जन्म देती है और पेट दर्द होता है सांस लेने में तकलीफ होती है और चमड़ी की बीमारियां होती है मतलब अंगों से अलग अलग अंगों से मतलब कुछ ना कुछ तकलीफें झेल रहे हैं हम लोग वहां पर As you know that Union Carbide set up its factory in 1969, and uh, they dug up three solar evap they dug up three ponds, which they called solar evaporation ponds. The idea was that it would just evaporate all of it, and they, this is where they dumped all their toxic waste. It was li it was uh, there was a plastic lining which breached back in '82, and the toxic waste started seeping into the groundwater. Uh, there was cattle that was dying. Union Carbide knew about this, never did anything, never told anyone either. Um, and now we know there are at least nine persistent organic pollutants and heavy metals that have been found in the water. People were getting sick from drinking this water. And even to get clean drinking water, we walked. We walked for we walked twice from Bhopal to Delhi, covering a distance of about 500 miles each time. We asked, we demanded our prime minister that he meet with us and he give us clean drinking water. He, police beat us, they put us in jail, but eventually we won. In 2012, we got clean drinking water. Uh, but when, when the pipeline is not work, working or when there is a municipal failure, there is no choice but to drink the contaminated water. Now they have found mercury in mother's breast milk. And there are children with uh, with birth defects, pro people with skin problems, cancers, and stomach problems as well. And this all happened to Union Carbide Company. Ki se. Union Carbide Company took the Dow Chemical and bought it. The whole company took it. So the responsibility of Dow is that because of that company, it was dumped there. It was cleaned there. It was cleaned there. It was cleaned there. It was cleaned there. और जो लोग मतलब अभी दो लाख लोग प्रभावित हैं उस पानी की वजह से जहरीले पानी की वजह से आने वाले समय में वो पानी आगे बढ़ता जा रहा है तो दो से चार लाख भी हो सकते हैं वो ये सब गांव को जिम्मेदारी लेना चाहिए पानी पीड़ितों को सही इलाज मिलना चाहिए और सही उनको मुआवजा भी मिलना चाहिए जो उनकी आने वाली पीढ़ी है उनका भी मिलना चाहिए और ये सब डाव केमिकल को जिम्मेदारी लेनी चाहिए और मतलब यहाँ के सरकार को बताएं सांसद में बात उठाएं कि भोपाल में जो जहर फैल रहा है उसकी सफाई होए और हमने यहाँ आकर भी देखा है यहाँ पे भी ऐसी स्थिति है कि मतलब गरीब लोगों के बीच में और काले लोगों के बीच में फैक्टरियाँ खुल जाती है और उससे मतलब जहर फैलता है प्रदूषण होता है तो हम आपसे यही चाहते हैं कि आप हमारा साथ दें और ये लड़ाई तब तक नहीं छोड़ेंगे तब तक इंसाफ नहीं मिलेगा ताकि जैसा भोपाल शहर है ऐसा कोई दूसरे देश में भोपाल शहर ना बने और अपनी आने वाली पीढ़ी को अपन बचा सकें और मैं यही आप सबसे कहूँगी कि लड़ेंगे जीतेंगे और डाव को झाड़ू मारेंगे और भोपाल की नारी है फूल नहीं चिंगारी है क्या बात है आई विल लॉट टू ट्रांसलेट है ओके यूनियन डाउ यूनियन कार्बाइड वाज टेकन ओवर बाय डाउ केमिकल एंड डाउ केमिकल नाउ सेज दैट दे हैव ओनली टेकन द एसेट्स बट नॉट इट्स लायबिलिटीज ऑल आई नो इट इज देयर रिस्पांसिबिलिटी टू क्लीन अप इट्स टॉक्सिक वेस्ट करंटली 200000 पीपल आर अफेक्टेड एंड न्यू पीपल आर एक्सपोज्ड टू दीस पॉइजंस एवरी डे वी ऑल वी आर सीकिंग इज अप्रोप्रिएट ट्रीटमेंट अप्रोप्रिएट कॉम्पेंसेशन एंड एंड क्लीन अप ऑफ दिस waste so we are asking to tell your government that there should be justice in bhopal we have seen well we have seen similar stuff here as well uh, but all i know that we will fight for justice uh, till we get justice and as we say in bhopal we shall fight we shall win and we are women of bhopal we are flames not flowers we will not wilt before your corporate powers and we will fight for justice Or, till the uh, day we die आप सब लोग तीन दिसंबर को कुछ करिए ताकि मतलब सरकार को मालूम चले और सरकार दाव पे दबाव डाले और भोपाल की जिम्मेदारी ले
but there is a lot mm-hmm. of faith that the US government will put pressure on Dow so she is saying that put do something See, that you do something on 3rd <laughs> december on <laughs> face <laughs> yes and she is a fan of facebook and insta so please put that on facebook and insta and tell that <laughs> uh, yes so that dow knows yes yeah yeah sorry <laughs> Thank you guys uh, for coming here uh, and listening to our stories. Mm. I appreciate uh, people that actually want to listen at this point. Mm. So my name is Jamie Wallace. I'm from East Palestine, Ohio, lifelong re- resident. Um, I have 47 immediate family members that live within the one mile zone of the train derailment. Uh, the night of the derailment, we have a very small town. Uh, you start to hear sirens and people get up and look out the windows because we probably know whose house they're going to. Uh, just hearing, you know, a really abnormal number of uh, first responders, and I first get a telephone call from my mother, who says there's a train that derailed. So, you know, pretty, you know, uh, worried at that point. Uh, once I started smelling the chemicals in the air, I realized this was more than, you know, just a derailment. Uh, there was no official plan of how to evacuate, how to let people know to evacuate. I actually found out from my mother that I needed to evacuate. Um, they had police officers going door to door. This was about 1130 at night. Um, it was very cold uh, when this derailment happened and actually the heater was broke in my car. I had been riding to work with somebody that week. So I packed up myself, my husband, my mother-in-law and my three-year-old daughter uh, bundled her up, put her in the car, and we had no clue where we were going to go. Uh, you know, there's only two hotels within the immediate area of East Palestine. Um, they booked up very quickly. My brother was lucky enough to get one of the rooms, so he asked, he said, just come stay with us. You know, we thought it was going to be for the night. We thought we'd be back, you know, home by the morning. Um, once we spent the night, the next morning, we found out that it was a little worse than what we had been told that the train had chemicals on it. We still were not told what chemicals were on that train. Um, We weren't told all the chemicals that were on the train until after the evacuation was lifted and we were told it was safe to go home. So we ended up finding our own hotel room in West Virginia nearby. Um, The Sunday after the derailment, the derailment happened on a Friday. I had to go back to my house because we didn't grab our prescriptions uh, you know, our medication when we ran out of the house at night. And, you know, I'd kind of talked to my husband before I left and he said, what are we going to do when they lift this evacuation? And I said, we're going to go home. If the EPA says it's okay, it's okay. Uh, you know, I have a master's degree, a law degree. That's what I learned in school. I know what the EPA does. It, it protects human health and environmental health. Uh, I pulled in my driveway, Sulphur Run, which is still one of the most highly contaminated creeks. Uh, it was about 10 steps from my front door. As soon as I pulled in my driveway, instantly, lungs were burning. I couldn't breathe. There's like a rash breaking out on my skin. My lips are burning. My tongue's burning. I look over and I see chemicals just free flowing down the creek. I didn't need a scientist to tell me that it wasn't okay to be there. When they lifted the evacuation, the EPA and CTEH, which is... Um, the company that the railroad hired to do all the testing offered an indoor air test of our homes where they simply took this little machine and walked through your house in about two minutes and said, everything's fine, everything's clear. And I said, wait a minute, what about, first of all, I asked what all chemicals are in the creek? We haven't even seen the manifest yet. Eh, you'll be getting that in a couple days. Has the creek water been tested? Like you can see the chemicals flowing down the creek. Eh, we'll get the test. Have you tested the soil? There's no reason to test the soil. And we later found out that the devices they used to test indoor air in our homes wasn't even sufficient. It didn't test for things like formaldehyde. Um, Other chemicals of concern, it could only test for emergency levels, which were only safe to be in for a very limited amount of time. But I wasn't taking that for an answer uh, because I have a four-year-old. So I fought with them. I got CTH to come down and look in my basement They saw creek water that came in. Um, 
there was an embankment on both sides of the creek where I live. My basement butted up to one of those embankments. And again, common sense tells you if there's chemicals in the water and the water rises when it rains, it's going in to the soil. So the next day, uh, Norfolk Southern called and they said, you know, yeah, there's some concern at your house. We'll move you out. You know, we'll pay for, uh, you know, your stuff to get moved and anything you need. You just tell us what you need and we'll get you out of there. And, uh, you know, I said, let me get back to you because they wanted me to give them a number. I, I don't know what my life is worth, you know. Um, I don't think that they were going to offer that much anyways, but I didn't even see what they were going to offer. Uh, I knew right away that I needed to let the rest of my community know. Uh, you know, my house was not possibly the only house that they were wrong about. They weren't just wrong about somebody who had a big mouth, who was outspoken. You know, there were other people in homes that were not safe. So that night they were having a town hall. It was the first town hall at the auditorium of our high school. EPA's there, our mayor's there, our congressman there. They're all saying everything's fine. No homes are contaminated. Uh, I could tell they were purposely avoiding me with the mic. Uh, and I told everybody, that's not true. My house was deemed contaminated this morning. I have it on video. Um, one of the first things I was told by a reporter is Ohio is a one consent state. You can record um, any conversation as long as you're a part of it. They only need your consent, not the consent of the other person. Uh, sounds dirty, didn't feel good, but I'm fighting for my baby's life. I'm gonna record you if you're not gonna tell the truth. I have it on you know, record. Not one person in that room ever contacted me to see that video. Uh, not one person took it seriously in our government. You know, we have been fighting since that day to try to get justice in East Palestine and to get people to see what really has happened there. I, when you talk about corporate greed, uh, I feel like human life's just a cost of doing business to them now. You know, there's a, there's a number on your life. They didn't care about us. Uh, obviously the EPA didn't care either. They told us it was safe to go back into our homes. I was told by a lot of other activists right away that uh, you know, they would try to divide our town. I said, there's no way they're gonna divide us. We're a tight knit small community. You wouldn't believe the people that have sold out. Um, you know, the residents have gotten zero, but there's a $25 million new park that's going in. They gave a million dollars to the school, another 750,000 to the school to recruit kids to come to a school that hasn't even been properly tested. Uh, you know, luckily, we were able early on to make some connections with some great nonprofit organizations. Um, Stephen, I'm gonna call you out in the room. Stephen Lester was the first person that let our community know what dioxin was. Like, you don't know that as an average person if you've never studied science, you've never been around chemicals. I didn't even know we should be asking for that. But every single thing that happened was because we fought every step of the way. They covered up the contamination. They had those tracks back up, trains running through our community less than 48 hours after they detonated those five tankers of vinyl chloride that didn't need to be detonated. Um, they did it because trains can't travel through evacuated communities. Um, there were trains going back through town before we were back in our homes. You know, and again, a small community we see you guys taking a lot of gravel in, but we don't see you guys taking any dirt out. Uh, you know, when we questioned it, that's when we found out that they just covered up these big pits of chemicals and built the tracks right over it. Um, since they'd already lifted the evacuation, uh, they started, in, well, then the EPA ordered Norfolk Southern to come back in and clean it up, but they only had to clean it up one track at a time as to keep the other track open. Then they did what was called a voluntary relocation for people. That way they didn't have to shut the tracks down. Uh, you know, I could sit here forever and tell you about all of the ways that we have been done wrong in East Palestine. One of my only, I guess, uh, things that have helped me mentally get through this, because some of it is unbelievable, you think this cannot possibly be happening to you, is talking to other survivors. Um, as hard as it is to hear the same thing still happening, at least I know I'm not crazy. You know, when the CDC comes in and tells your doctors to quit testing people for vinyl chloride 
and you're standing in your doctor's office saying, I want to be tested for vinyl chloride, and they're saying the CDC told us we can't test you. It's almost surreal. But then you talk to someone from Bhopal, where they had the medicine and the government, you talk to someone from the BP oil spill, and they're like, oh, they're still doing that. You know, and, and part of this is we've got to open our eyes to all these hazards around us. We have to make real change, or this is going to happen again. And don't think they're going to treat your community any different than we've been treated. Um, you know, we still have children that are sick. Uh, adults, we're seeing more uh, neurological issues already. We're seeing uh, heart issues, people that are having heart attacks right after the derailment. And this is only not even two years out. Uh, we've been really lucky to team up with Dr. Glom from University of California, San Diego. She was a huge part in the Gulf War illness and all of our men and women returning home with symptoms from the burn pits. Um, she's now studying us in East Palestine. And we know that these chemicals affect your DNA. So this is not just an issue for me. This is multi-generational. You know, this is something that we have to fight for for years and years and years. I'm sitting here listening to these women 40 years later. My daughter was the same age when this happened. And I'm picturing my daughter sitting here. Uh, you know, the CDC came into East Palestine to go door to door. The workers got sick. They never told us. They dipped out. We demanded that they come back once it was discovered through a FOIA. And we wanted to hear from the CDC. And the CDC flat out told us, you all have chemicals in your body. We don't know what to do about it, but we can treat the cancer it causes. Why wasn't that on every news channel across the United States? You know, it, it, this has just blown up so many systemic issues from the media to the government. Uh, you know, it's almost like I had been living in this fantasy world my whole life where I trusted my government and my government did the right thing. And to see how our government is actually abandoning us for the money of these corporations. Uh, you know, I knew that money and lobbyists had a lot to do with the politics in DC, but I didn't realize that it influenced people to the point of them, you know, sacrificing children. You know, I keep saying this Railway Safety Act, like you're playing politics on the Hill with my child's life. You know, nobody asked if we were Republicans or Democrats before that train derailed there. You know, and when you talk about justice and accountability, Norfolk Southern poisoned thousands of people purposefully. We know that now. NTSB said there was another option, let it cool. They withheld that information, let it cool off. They said that the one of the tankers was, uh, they said it was going to explode because it was heating up so much that they thought that the uh, vinyl chloride was gonna polymerize, I can't say that word, <laughs> polymerize and, and explode it, uh, but it wasn't going to. And the owners of the vinyl chloride told Norfolk Southern that. Norfolk Southern never told Governor DeWine, he never told our local officials, they never told anyone. And that's why they blew those tankers up. There was no need to do that whatsoever. Norfolk Southern had threatened the chair of the NTSB. Um, well, what they did, and it, and it still doesn't make sense because there was only one tanker that they said was gonna blow up. Um, and if it did, it would have thrown shrapnel within a mile radius. So what they did is they dug these big ditches and they actually had to do two of them because for some reason they decided to blow all five tankers of vinyl chloride that were at two different locations. So they dug these big ditches next to the trains. They somehow tapped into them and drained all the chemicals into the ditch and then caught the ditch on fire. And that's what is the big chemical mushroom cloud that people have seen. Uh, so not only did they poison the people of East Palestine, there are studies now that this stuff traveled to 16 different states, uh, you know, in this big chemical cloud. And what it was is they wanted to get that railroad back up and running. That's what it was about. You know, they could have let it cool. They could have drained it and put it into other tankers and taken it out. But they were losing so much money for 
every hour that that train track was down that they didn't care. You know, if, if I poisoned my husband for his life insurance, I'd be in prison. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, they poisoned thousands of people mm -hmm. and somehow got our local government to turn around and thank them. Uh, you know, it, it just, it blows my mind that the way that it has split our community and these people that have sold out for money, they've blocked our voices from the politicians when they would come into town. Our mayor would choose who the politicians talked to. Uh, wasn't talking to the people, they were talking to the business owners who very early on all got together and decided they were gonna push for economic recovery. Um, can't push for economic recovery and human health at the same time, because who's gonna come there if you're all sick? It took 17 months for a city official to mention human health issues, um, and he was newly elected. 17 months before they ever mentioned anything when they're watching people in the community, children with bloody noses, with blood coming out of their ears, people covered in chloracne, people covered in rashes, asthma. Half of our kids just came down with asthma and the EPA is handing out a coloring book called Dusty the Goldfish with Asthma and what asthma triggers are. Uh, you know, it's, <laughs> it is, it's, it's laughable. You know, I remember telling a reporter about a community liaison that Norfolk Southern gave a million dollars to to spend on the needs of the community. The first thing he did was bought all the kids ice cream cones, uh, got everybody's hair cut. You could go get your dog groomed for free. They were paying for that. And this, the reporter laughed and said, you're joking. And I said, no, that's what they're being done with the money that they're posting all over TV that they gave to the community. Uh, so, you know, I know that this is gonna be a long haul fight this is just the beginning. There's still contamination in our town. Um, it could very easily hit the groundwater. In fact, the EPA keeps saying when it does, when it does. Uh, so I'm pretty sure that they know that at some point it's going to hit, you know, our, our groundwater. Uh, I don't know that they can ever clean this up. They let it sit so long. You know, at first I talked about you could see the chemicals flowing down the creek. And then the EPA says, well, it's clean now. No chemicals until you took a stick and poked it into the yeah. sediment. Yeah. And then there's a rainbow volcano that erupts. And then the EPA says, oh, those are legacy chemicals. They've always been there. Uh, no, we are country people. We fish in those creeks. We swim in those creeks. I spent more time in those creeks as a kid than you know, anybody had, and I'd never seen a chemical volcano. Uh, you know, They started the cleanup process. What happened? Chemicals flowing back down the stream. One of our creek rangers um, had to go tell, I'm sorry, creek rangers are uh, a group of people that go in the creeks and monitor them. We call them our creek rangers, like they've been in there since day one. They're the ones that have proven, like shown that there's still contamination. They're the ones that called the EPA and said there's chemicals free flowing back down the creek. And the EPA says, oh, that's unacceptable. And we stopped them as soon as we saw the chemicals coming down the creek. Where was the EPA? You put basically Norfolk Southern out there and tell them clean it up. Uh, you know, that was their solution to the problem. But it's a, it's a bigger problem. You know, there's a, a bigger problem with the amount of plastics and things that we use in the United States. We're working with um, Break Free from Plastic, or sorry, Toxic Free Future right now on a petition to Home Depot, um, you know, to stop using so many of the products that contain the vinyl chloride. Because the more we use, the more it's being shipped around the United States. And this isn't just a problem in East Palestine. This is a problem for anyone in the United States that lives within 30 miles of railroad tracks. Um, you know, and not only is it a problem for the people, it's a problem for the first responders. Uh, you know, every day first responders, well, it feels like every day and it almost is, our uh, first responders are going to these, uh, you know, train derailments and most of them are not even trained in hazmat because they put these, I found this out at NTSB. The hazardous trains, they reroute them through the rural areas, but our rural fire departments, the volunteer fire uh, fighters don't have to be trained in hazmat. So now you're putting the most dangerous chemicals through communities where people are not even trained to deal with them. They told our first responders that it was malt liquor and to treat it like a house fire. Um, so we had 85 different police depart or fire departments that came in from all around and they're spraying hundreds of thousands of gallons of water 
onto these tankers of chemicals right next to the creek. Uh, you know, so it we have just been failed on so many different levels here. Um, we feel like we've been abandoned. You know, you talk about the lawyers and getting money. Um, I'm not even going to get $500 out of the lawsuit. They have decided, uh, you know, it looks like this big, huge number all over to TV. Like, I think it's like $610 million or, but they don't break it down and tell you what the people are actually getting. The attorneys are getting 180 million. Mm -hmm. They're given $70,000 per household to anyone within the one to two mile zone. My family of four, that's $17,000 a piece. Um, but wait, we would get zero because all that time that we were out of our home and evacuated, moving from hotel to hotel room, four people in a hotel room, eating out three times a day, they're taking all that money that they gave us to relocate and they're deducting it from that $70,000. Uh, so we end up with zero dollars and the attorneys have 180 million. So for the people that had contaminated homes, for the people that were the most sick, the most chemically sensitive, zero dollars, you're still stuck in that contaminated home with no way to get out. Uh, you know, these corporations are controlling our government now. They're you know, disregarding human life. Like, when is enough enough? Uh, you know, and when do people start paying attention to all the dangers around them? I never thought about a train full of chemicals, uh, you know, derailing in my community. Like I said, you think about, what if my car stalls on the railroad tracks? Or what if, and after the derailment, then I start looking around and we have an incinerator, mm -hmm. 15, minutes away we have i'm sure you guys saw the plastic plant the shell plastic plant, plant yeah. 20 minutes and then you go to you know climate week and you're hearing about sacrifice zones and it's like wait i live in a sacrifice zone <laughs> but when you're born there you don't realize yeah. it yeah it's just normal you know you grow up with the incinerator all it's just the incinerator just the tracks or and i really wish that someone would have warned me and told me to open my eyes and shame on me for never paying attention when you hear things on TV like Bhopal or Flint, you know, you just think, well, everything's fine in Flint, the EPA is there, right? Uh, but until you have to deal with something like this, you don't know the reality of what happens. We feel completely abandoned. It took Biden over a year to come. His own son died because of exposure to the chemical burn pit. Mm -hmm. The same doctor, mm -hmm that was studied that and helped find out about Gulf War illness is now studying us. Like where is just the empathy as a human being to know what we're gonna have to go through. Like it was so hard listening to you ladies and I appreciate it so much, but it's almost a little glimpse of our future. Um, and we need this to stop. And like she said, it's not just about justice for me or my family or for them and their family. It's about the entire communities that have been, been impacted. And it's also about your children, you know, your homes. Like I said, if you live within 30 miles of a railroad track, this isn't just helping us. This is helping your children, uh, making sure that this doesn't happen in your community. And the other people I have to mention, because they're in the room, are the people that work for the railroad too. You know, the danger that they were put in, OSHA had to come in. They were making people go in there and clean that stuff up with no PPE, and you know why? Because if they saw people walking around in PPE, then you knew that something was wrong. So they make those people go in there, the, their employees go in there, they have, you know, people, they're cutting back on, you know, the number of people on these trains. I don't know if you've ever sat there and watched how long a train is. They wanna put one person on that train. You know, how fair is it to that one person too, to put all that pressure on you to be responsible for, a mile long train full of chemicals, uh, you know? So we have to make those big systemic changes and it has to go beyond the borders to where these companies are operating internationally. Like it makes me sick to think that my government has abandoned Bhopal, uh, but it doesn't surprise me because they abandoned us too. So I thank you guys um, for listening. And please bring awareness because I don't think that any American would be okay with sick children, um, with children being born 40 years later with birth defects. I just, I have to believe in my heart, it's a lack of awareness and them not knowing. I just can't believe that that many people don't care. So thank you guys.
so much for the presentations, all four of you. Oh, sorry. Thank you so much for the presentations, all four of you. And um, I should apologize that the event started late because um, four of us, Bhatibai and Rachna and Farhat and myself, we were um, on, you know, we were in meetings on Capitol Hill that took forever. So <laughs> we got here late. Um, so uh, I had planned to have a little bit of a panel discussion where I would ask our presenters some questions, but in the interest of time, I'm going to skip that part and go directly to um, questions from all of you. And I'll start with Fritz and Adam from Railroad Workers United, who, yes, who are organizing Railroad workers Railroad around issues such as this. My name is Fritz Edler, and I won't take much of your time because I know you have a lot of questions, and I want to thank these sisters for their testimony. And uh, I was already working on the rails at the time of the disaster in Bhopal, and uh, we started putting together a lot of uh, the information that we could get, and we did organize a public forum at the time. So many things have come out since then, and so we th see these things uh, – all the time, unfortunately. So I'm an international special representative for Railroad Workers United, and that one of the, my jobs is to go to different places where disasters like these have taken place and get into the railroad side of it from the point of view of the railroad workers. Uh, it was on the morning of May Day, I want to say it was 2017, I was just returning from the town of Lac Megantic, where in 2013 a disastrous uh, rail explosion destroyed a good part of a town, vaporized 47 people immediately. And I got back to D.C., and a CSX train had just derailed right here in Washington, D.C., right close to where the Rhode Island Avenue Metro Station is concerned. And the circumstances of it were pretty similar to the ones in some respect that what happened in East Palestine. And so in some case, in some respects, this is sort of a mundane thing, the question of the whether the proper inspections have been done and, and lengths of the train, procedures, things like that, to make, make the difference between a really bad disaster and one that is less so or whatever. Um, <clears throat> I just make that point for those of you that are local to emphasize the point that all the sisters did, which was that this can happen in your community. And of course, I represent railroad workers, and my concern is for the, those, you know, those folks that end up suffering. But um, uh, I just want everybody to understand that that there is something that's behind all of this in the United States and also in these other places, and that is the private operation of these railroads. And it's been true since the very beginning. This is something that's not clearly understood by lots of folks. It's been true since the beginning, but it's just chronic problem that gets kicked down the road. And um, uh, a colleague of mine is here uh, who I'd like to have him get a chance to speak just real quickly on that question, which is the question of public, the public state, public, public ownership. Hey, uh, I'm Adam Barrington. I'm the national organizer for Railroad Workers United's public rail ownership campaign, Public Rail Now. Um, so yeah, as, as Fritz mentioned, um, the overall issue here is the fact that we have a profit-driven private rail system, and as we just heard, it's not just the rail system, it's all these massive companies that put profit before people that, um, like it was said, you know, it's the cost of doing business. You know, your, your life as a human being is calculated, you know, and that's like one of my issues in hearing these things called accidents or disasters, it's, well, accidents and disasters, that's one thing, but these are calculated events that are in an equation. And so when you see this happening time and time again, 
it's kind of hard not to think, well, there's something intrinsically wrong with this system. It's a systemic problem. Um, so what we are doing is actively building a coalition of impacted communities, unions on the rail and, and off the rail, um, environmentalist organizations and advocates, um, anybody and everybody who's um, interested in getting involved and pushing for a rail system in the United States that operates in the public interest and is accountable to the public. And so, as Fritz mentioned, it hasn't been this way always. I mean, there has been multiple times in U.S. history where the rail system, either sections of it or the, in its entirety, have been nationalized because it was found that while it's run uh, privately, it's, it's a disaster. It's a catastrophe, you know. So um, the, another thing that I want to like make clear here is that this goes beyond just public rail now in, in the United States. When we look at what happened in Bhopal, we look at what happens all the time um, in sacrifice zones, as they're called. If you're a working class or you're a, a poor person, you're on the chopping block. And that means all of us. And so, you know, it, it's very painful to hear all these things that have happened. And I, if you're like me, it, it really physically hits you in the chest. Um, but what's powerful is the internationalism that I see here, that we have an international interest as a working class, and we have the enemy in our sights, and we know what needs to happen. And um, I hope that you will get in touch with us and become involved in our campaign for, for public ownership of the railroads here and the continued fight elsewhere as well. Um, and we have pamphlets and literature out there, and um, I'll give you my business card or anything. I'm willing to talk to anybody and everybody. So um, yeah, if you'd like to get involved, please let me know. And thank you all so much for, for everything. And the struggle continues. Ben Ramos. Thank you. And on to you, Jane. Thanks, Basov and everybody. Um, my name is Jane Patton. I'm with um, Dustin and Holly from the Center for International Environmental Law. Um, I'm also from New Orleans, Louisiana. That's where I live. I know you guys were just there last week. I missed you. Sorry. I also took a train to get here from New Orleans, which was very fun. It took almost a day and a half. Um, my question is, you mentioned that y'all were on the Hill today, um, and you mentioned the Railway Safety Act. My question is, is there a specific, there's a Bhopal or a, a chemical disaster recognition, day of recognition bill and the Railway Safety Act. Can you say more about the specific pieces of legislation that we should be contacting our representatives about just so we know what they are? That would be great. Uh, the Railway Safety Act is something that was a bipartisan piece of legislation that was introduced uh, shortly after the East Palestine train derailment. Uh, but since then, it's kind of lost steam. Uh, they've been pulling things out of it. Uh, it's just been stalled. And, you know, what I was just telling to someone before this event is tomorrow I'm going up on Capitol Hill. And I have a few meetings and I have a few people whose offices I'm just going to stop into that are stalling this bill because I don't understand how Republican, Democrat, I don't care who you are, how can you be against safety? If you're against safety, you're against the people and you shouldn't be sitting up there on Capitol Hill. You're playing politics with my daughter's life. You know, you're playing politics literally with human lives. Uh, so I don't know if they're just so disconnected from the people and what their policies actually mean to communities or not. Uh, but I'm going to remind them tomorrow that we're going to continue this fight. Um, as these ladies I've met here today, uh, you know, I always say I'm a mama bear and I'll fight to the death for my children. Uh, and I don't just mean a grizzly bear. I mean, I'll fight Norfolk Southern. I'll fight our very own government. You poison my child, thousands of children, and you're not just gonna walk away from that. There's gonna be accountability, and I know that I'm gonna be fighting this till the day I die. Um, and I imagine that, like I said, my daughter's probably gonna be sitting here still fighting it because these chemicals are not gonna be gone from our communities 
and this these disasters are not going to go away if we do not hold these companies accountable and that's what we need is accountability um it's never going to stop you know these fines if you know if i say uh you know somebody gets on my nerves and i smack them and they say okay you have a three dollar fine what am i going to do next time they get on my nerves for three dollars i'm probably going to smack them you know and that's what that's what they're doing here and this is not just about east palestine we're setting precedent you know even this lawsuit you know with this lawsuit we're telling these corporations what the cost of our lives are so then they can look at that when they look at their risk analysis are they making more than the number of lives that they're going to destroy that they're going to take they have to have some kind of accountability and if our government's not going to give it to it give it to them then the people will I'm sorry. <laughs> so, uh, yes, there is going to be a resolution in the House uh, very soon. I, it will be uh, most likely introduced by uh, Re Representative Jay Paul, and it is declaring December 3rd as a chemical disaster awareness day. And we bring in a lot of history of what has happened. I think this is the only way to get it out. And so, yes, so yes, it would be very good. We are trying to do, we would like similar thing to happen in the Senate um, also, and more importantly, we would want a, a hearing on, a, a Bhopal hearing, you know, to happen. The last hearing on Bhopal happened in 1985 um, here, and, uh, you know, and, uh, and, the main thing that came out of that, I mean, I read some of the quotes from that hearing, and I mean, other than just being just plain racist, you know, basically saying that the lives of Indian people are just not worth the same as the life of Americans. And Union Carbide basically saying, oh, this could never happen in Institute where their sister <laughs> facility was, which blew up two years later, and then in 2008, and MIC didn't was continue to be manufactured till almost 2011. You know, so you know what and what Jamie has been saying. You know, there are so many parallels. And what was the saddest thing for me was someone from East Palestine came up to us and comparing notes, basically, what will happen? This is what I'm having now. My nine-year-old has started her menstrual cycle. I've had my gallbladder removed. I've had this, and she was literally comparing notes with us and asking these asking them what will happen what will happen to the children and this is that there is no knowledge they don't no one knows yeah and most importantly uh, the people whose job it is to protect our health and environment are too busy working for the polluters and you know and Bhopal, East Palestine, Bhopal, Cancer Alley, all of those, uh, you know, uh, we, and, and, you know, from Bhopal, corporations learn so much. Uh, I mean, not only about deflecting responsibility, not only about creating corporate whales so you can never catch the per person, but also to hire the best PR people so you can repeat the same lie so many times that it seems like the gospel truth at the end of 40 years, right? And to hire the <laughs> best l lawyers. And, and as collectively as people, you know, uh, there is no international fora where people from Bhopal or East Palestine can go when they feel wronged by their own governments or by, you know, there is nothing. Where, you know, even if you win in Ecuador, like in the Chevron case, what do you do? You wait for that judgment to be executed here, and that's not going to happen. Yeah, uh, because at the end of the day, it is, you know, we have this corporations kill people, people elect governments, governments protect corporations. We have this, we have this as a postcard in, 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 in Bhopal. So unless and until we reimagine a lot of, I, I'm not really answering your question, I'm just yapping. But <laughs> I'm just saying, unless, because it is, unless and until the, some of this stuff is reimagined, you know, it, it, just prove, prove your half a mile, two miles, half a, you know, the, the, you know, we're gonna be just, uh, we're just doing this rat race with them how they want it, and they have this figured out.
And the chemicals don't stop at borders. So yeah, exactly. You know, like, like I said, it's not like the chemicals were like, we're at a one mile zone that exactly. stop, or we're at an international border that's yeah. not cross that. Yeah. You know, these chemicals, you know, they go from state to state, from country to country. And I did want to mention something when you're asking about like what kind of actions. We are still fighting for a federal disaster declaration in East Palestine. It would hope, open up a lot of federal funds. It would, you know, open us up to potentially getting health care. Um, you know, these all these lawsuit settlements, you know, none of them include our health. Uh, they're going to study us. You know, they'll monitor our health. But what happens when they see yeah. all the cancers? Well, you, it's not because of those right. chemicals. Though. Yeah, so and, and now we have it. Yeah, now we have it documented. But go ahead and, yeah. you know, yeah. die. And it, it is, I mean, just listening, usually I'm a lot more focused and organized when I speak. I feel like I was all over the place tonight because just listening to you guys and listening to your stories, like you said, you know, running the parallels mm -hmm. and it's 40 years later and nothing has changed. 40 years, something has to change. It has to. And what you mentioned about the compensation being deducted, same thing happened in Bhopal, the $500, because it took eight to 18 years. So when your time came and if you had been paid $200, you only got 300. So, you know, and just like they wanted the railroads to run fast so that they, they, they were not losing any money, the basically when the disaster happened, there was still MIC remaining in the tanks and they wanted to use that for making the pesticides. So literally it is called Operation Faith, like people should have faith on the UCC to make this and the entire city fled. And some people never came back. Entire city fled because there was this thing that they, they're going to do this and they wanted to do this because they wanted to make, they didn't want to waste anything. They wanted to make it into a product. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That was more yeah. important, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So the parallels are just, just there. And it's very sad. I have a question. Mm -hmm. With the magnitude of this tragedy 40 years ago, has it influenced at all the conversation um, at any level, you know, geographically uh, around how generations lived in the past without dependence on the chemicals in the way that we do now and how we need to move in the future? Has it had that impact at all? to influence the conversation about moving away from dependence on chemicals? In India? No. I don't know about here, but <laughs> no. No, I mean, because of Bhopal, there was this whole thing about right to know here. You got that. You could find out what chemicals, but no, not, not, I would. I also do think it has also a lot to do with people who are considered expendable. Yeah, mm -hmm. and people who were affected, yeah. Like we say in Bhopal, if this was to happen on the other side of Bhopal, where more rich people lived and more bureaucrats lived and mm -hmm. more ministers lived, maybe it would be different. But, you know, just, uh, and uh, for Indian government, foreign direct investment takes, you know, precedence over killing few hundred thousand people or maiming yeah really does i mean and we've seen this i mean in 2005 um, you know there was going to be um, an out of court settlement between union carbide and dow chemical because they had proposed that they will invest 100 billion dollars in india on the condition that they are absorbed of their bhopal legacy that's what they call it right bhopal <laughs> legacy cases yeah remove those cases and it almost came to that if we didn't have a right to information act like what you have a FOIA, right? Uh, you know, uh, we, we it would have happened. It, it was a done deal. It would just we just got the documents, we exposed it, and they, I mean, they, they do have some shame, one can say. So they that they go through. But now, yeah. So no, I don't think the dialogue has changed. In fact, we at a foreign direct investment at any cost is very very dear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All about the money. Yeah. Yeah. 
and and we saw the U.S. government also play a very big role. I mean, the Bhopal plant was set up by loan from the Exim Bank. Yeah, we got this from the K Henry Kissinger lobby that it first that accept the settlement, whatever Union Carbide was giving, which costed them 43 cents per share. And then when Indian government, yes, late, asked for extradition of Anderson, they denied it, saying it would, from FOIA, they, it would send shockwaves through the investment climate. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I mean, your government, my government, it's, yeah. It's all government. It's, yeah, it's yeah. Sim, sim bullshit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. First of all, I want to thank I, yeah, your stories are very powerful, really powerful. Thank to you. hear you talk about being in those buildings when you didn't know what was going on in the middle of the night, um, it's, it's very powerful to hear. Uh, as always, the stories are very powerful. The question I have for you, I mean, is about the, the, the contamination. You talk about there's still contamination 40 years later, the water, the soil. Can you talk a little more about that and why that still persists 40 years later? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, because I think our was a while project a cube producer as the cute jari hai, as the ski so I cute you you're basically asking why there hasn't been a cleanup. Is that the question? Yeah, this piece of I cute. तो ये पूछ रहे हैं कि वो सफाई क्यों नहीं हो पाई है क्योंकि सरकार क्योंकि कंपनी बोलती है कि ये तो हमारा जुरिस्टिक्शन ही नहीं है इसके ऊपर ना हाँ सो बेसिक रीजन इज दैट देर इज अ केस हैपनिंग दैट फॉर द क्लीनअप अगेंस्ट यूनियन कार्बाइड एंड डाउ केमिकल सिंस 2004 and uh, the both of them say that uh, well union carbide has refused to appear they're a proclaimed absconder they just don't show up and dow chemical says we are a u.s corporation and indian courts have no jurisdiction over us now the question is why isn't the government of india doing anything right why aren't they cleaning this up so we we have fought this on both fronts for a uh, you know there is denial of contamination by uh, uh, by the government of india they we have letters that were written by union carbide officials uh, to our chief minister saying these groups are making too much noise about contamination do something ab about them yeah and so but i mean how much can you hide there there are several reports out now that show that say that there is groundwater contamination of up to 200 feet and these are the chemicals that are there but again there has been no comprehensive and scientific assessment done of the depth and spread of the contamination and our government really does not want to do it because then they would actually have to do something about about the problem yeah so there they they have gone on to this saying okay there is 350 metric tons of waste lying within the factory and they want the entire world to believe that that's the only waste uh, that is problematic whereas the contamination is happening with the waste that is lying in the solar evaporation ponds and in the unlined pits within the factory yeah so to this 40th anniversary they're going to make a big deal that how they're going to incinerate 0.02 percent of that waste and incinerate it in a facility and will release dioxin and furons to the nearby community and they tested this seven times failed six times exposing people there but this is going to be their big because there is direct so while the official position is yes dow will be held 
accountable for union carbide, but the backdoor signal is we will let you invest as much as, so their market share has gone up tremendously in the last uh, 10 years in the current uh, government. And they have literally no in interest in, 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 in resol resolving this. So what we did is we fought for toxic waste removal and but we also fought violently to get clean drinking water because at least if, unless and until this gets cleaned up, people don't have to drink contaminated water, which is what we talked about. But uh, it's one one reason, and the only reason is that because a government wants to protect Dow Chemical and not its mm -hmm. people. That's the short answer to that. It really speaks to how powerful these companies are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so, so you mentioned that the extent of the groundwater uh, pollution is not known because the government has not tested it, right? But, but what about academic interest? Yes. I mean, you do have a lot of groups testing the ground uh, water for pollution and so on. Um, that, I mean, that must have taken on quite a life of its own, right? So. <laughs> So the, the, there has been death studies, yes, yes. Two kilometers, yes, three kilometers, four kilometers, but how far, how deep, there is not where. I mean, we have scientific agencies like NIDI, which were getting paid by Union Carbide's consultant to say, it. literally, this is part of the report which says, it will take another 23 years for the contamination to reach groundwater. It, it, is, it, is, a state, it is a statement in a scientific report of National Engineering Research Institute. Then, because Government of India wanted to say, oh, this, there is no problem, there is no problem with the waste, they wanted to open the factory gates, they literally got the chairman of the the Defense, Defense Research Development Organization, this is a federal body, right, DRDO, saying if a person weighing 70 kilograms ingests, eats the seven that's sitting there, and I kid you not, this is what the letter says, nothing will happen to them. So, I mean, we have scientific agencies, I mean, that's what we have seen so many times, that are not for the environment or for science at all. I mean, if you look at, you know, so there have been studies by non, you know, non-government bodies and even including Greenpeace, including all that, but well, yeah, all of that. But who's believing that? Yeah, that's in court. Okay, court will decide. Court has been deciding for 20 some years, yeah. And it was only on the basis of those studies that we got clean drinking water. I mean, clean drinking water came through court and it took 12 years of fighting on the street, getting arrested, fasting, you know, doing everything you could possibly do to get clean drinking water, yeah. And yeah, you fight for, by the time your fight is over, the contamination has spread to another 20 communities communities and then you fight for that you know yeah yeah but yeah th there are you know i'm just saying but at the end of the day what you're saying yes even if we it, yes there are certain facts that are already known yes that there is contamination very little has happened in in cleaning up that place at, le at least i mean the actual source of contamination yeah yeah um, justin i'm going to let you have the last question in the interest of time since we should be wrapping up Yes, and I'll, I'll try to make this quick as well. And actually, my question is really not so much for the panel, but for folks who are listening at home. My name is Dustin White. Um, I live in West Virginia. I live as the crow flies five miles from the Institute plant that was the sister plant to the one in Bhopal. In 2014, 300,000 residents in nine counties in West Virginia had their public water intake contaminated by a chemical called MCHM. So my question is, you know, in this room, you've heard from folks from Bhopal, you've heard from folks from East Palestine. We have someone from Louisiana here and I'm from West Virginia. What are you going to do to make sure that we don't have to live like this anymore? You have power and you have privilege and our communities are suffering. So what are you going to do? What are the steps you're going to take to make sure that this doesn't keep happening? And I'm gonna end it there, thank you. Thank you. That's a great question and a great note to end on because ultimately that is the struggle that 
has brought us together today. And huge thank you to all of you for um, spending this evening with us. And to end with, a huge hand of applause for all four of our presenters today who who really spent a lot of time educating us on something we all need to understand and internalize. And with that, thank you for coming. Mm -hmm. And we have sign-up sheets. I hope you've signed. We have some T-shirts if you want to buy. Other yes, ones. lots of materials on yes, the table. And some information in the back. you'd like to take, please. Thank you. Yeah. We, we went down for a pipeline safety.